All right. All right. So I think we're good. Thank you again for everyone. Uh, I'm JB. And the other guy at the top of your screen on the right side is JC. And uh, we're co-founders of FFL Consultants. Today is our January session for Ask Us Anything. Uh, if you're not talking, just try to mute your computer or your phone if you dialed in. And let's get going. Uh, for anybody new, as you know, we deal with everything from your licensing to your adverse actions and everything in between, answering all your questions. We are the primary consultants for the National Shooting Sports Foundation regarding compliance, security, OSHA, range, uh, regulations, uh, everything in between. You need help running a business, we can probably give you a quick answer or find somebody who can. Uh, today's session is going to focus on uh, just three different areas. Uh, if you were with us in December, we talked a lot about the zero tolerance program initiated by the Biden administration. And this person, uh, AG Merrick Garland, uh, there's been progress on their part and uh, unfortunately adverse action on FFLs recently. So we'll share those stories and scenarios with you. It's going exactly in the direction we thought it would go. Um, we'll talk a little bit, bit, a little bit about the campaign and why we believe the zero tolerance uh, program is uh, trying to gain some speed. And then, but first, we'll give you some ATF updates on the different things you may have been either reading about or getting directly from the ATF, or even a little bit confused about because we had some confusion recently that will uh, help explain for you. Again, if you got questions, just put them in the chat room, and uh, here we go. All right. Uh, first of all, Form 3310.4. We've talked. We talk about this in every presentation. What we've been talking about is making sure you complete it and submit it on time, and include the respective copy with your 4473 when filing. The issue now is that evidently uh, the ATF republished this form back in December, and no one knew about it. And I think they're not admitting to this, but I think they forgot about it, telling everybody about it. So back on the ATF website, and I'm not even sure the uh, software vendors were advised of it, but 3310.4 was redesigned to look more like the entry, the data entry and informational entry process you have on a 4473. In other words, uh, on a multiple handgun form in the columns for my, uh, that used to read type, serial number, manufacturer, model, importer, and caliber, they've realigned it so that manufacturer and importer are entered first, then your model number, then your serial number, type of firearm, and then caliber. And the last column there is transfer date. Now, when they updated that to realign all of these columns, again, to, be, to align better with the 4473, they, meaning the ATF, someone there, accidentally put acquisition date in that far right column on uh, item number three. And they caught the uh, issue recently and they've re-uploaded and republished this and wanted everybody to know. Unfortunately, uh, only by chance did we get notification that this actually occurred. And that there's even a new form out there. So uh, look at the bottom of our screen that you're looking at. Uh, there's two revision dates. The 2019 form should be discontinued. And the two, December 2021 form should be the form you either are using through your software vendor or downloading from the ATF uh, uh, online uh, forms directory if necessary. So uh, the first question is, am I gonna get in trouble for using the old form? We don't think so, but no one's talked to us and no one has actually published any type of corrective measure or, or ruling on this or any type of communication. So best bet is just go download the new form, start using the new form effective today. You don't need to resubmit anything. Uh, just move forward, as we say, and uh, have the right form in place. Um, kind of interesting that no one saw any update notification back in December. Okay. All right. JC, why don't we jump into what's happening with E4, E4 form four since it went live. So the E4 platform has been updated. Go to the next slide, John. So the e-form platform has been updated. There's been a, a few additions out there. Uh, form 1s and Form 4s uh, can all be submitted electronically now. Uh, 
Uh, with the Form 1, obviously, that's an individual who's made their own NFA firearm. Um, that is totally separate. You all don't need to worry about that. But the E-Form 4 is an opportunity for you, for your NFA dealers out there, to submit everything electronically. Now, it comes with a couple caveats. It's a little bit more labor intensive because, obviously, you're going to be doing it at a computer, sitting down with the customer, making sure they fill out their portions correctly and you making sure you fill out all your portions correctly. Uh, in addition to that, if you want to go a full electronic path, you're going to have to get a couple of uh, peripherals, uh, such as a live scan device, which is a device for taking fingerprints. Uh, so far, we've priced them out, and they're running anywhere from four to $8,000 for the device. Uh, it's actual scanner, and the reason why it's uh, a live scan, it has to be compatible with the requirements of the ATF um, is because it actually verifies that the fingerprints are of good enough quality uh, to submit electronically. In addition to that, you're also gonna have to get the capability to take a picture. And it's gonna have to meet the requirements of basically a passport photo. So you wanna, you know, the whole, you know, shoulder, head, uh, you know, plain look, no smiles or anything like that. <laughs> Um, so you have to have those capabilities or you have to have the capability of obtaining it electronically, such as on a thumb drive or some other form of media and uploading it in the FT format. So if you don't have those capabilities, then you're still going to have to go through the same old process of sending the customer to get their fingerprints and sending the customer to get their passport photos. So, um, you know, is it more labor intensive? Yes. From what I've seen, I've witnessed uh, two just this last week. Uh, processes. So the labor intensive part is it takes you away from the counter or it takes an, a staff member away from the counter and uh, causes them to have to sit down with the customer for that time it takes to fill everything out, get the fingerprints. He had left the... for a little while, but now he is back there. Uh, I don't know who that is, but please mute your line. Got it. <clears throat> so um, go back one. Sorry. The other piece to this is, um, all right, you can advance. I just, I remember what I was gonna say. Um, the anticipation is, is that if you go full electronic and submit everything electronic, uh, the anticipation, probably not right away, but down the road is that we're going to get turns on form fours in about two to three months uh, because there's less human interaction and an examiner doesn't have to touch everything and verify everything. It's all verified systemically. So hopefully, um, probably within the next year, I would say, uh, you'll start seeing uh, these being returned within two to three months rather than the eight to 12 months or six to nine months, depending uh, on the time frame, uh, turnaround time that we've seen traditionally. So uh, yeah, huge win for the industry, uh, but just be aware, just because the E-Form 4 is out there, doesn't mean that you don't still have to have the means to do the fingerprints and the photo. And if you can't do that, then you're gonna to have to go through it with the old process. Make sense, hopefully. Yep. Uh, again, if you have questions, just use that chat room, I'll hold them to the end. The next uh, informational piece that came out from the ATF, this week, let's say in the last week actually, was the safe storage bulletin. Uh, if, you, if you haven't seen this, or you probably read about it versus getting it direct from the ATF, but this is making its rounds very quickly. Uh, it's a concerning, it's nothing new in our mind, but it's a concerning uh, issue that we all need to be aware of. And basically, uh, it's, a, it's called a, a final rule. So this is actually being added to the Federal Register, uh, the CFR, and this issue by, again, uh, A.G. Garland under the Biden administration. And uh, along with, it's part of the best practices guide for FFLs, but this is requiring all retailers to certify they do in fact offer some sort of secure storage option for sale at the time of a firearm transfer. Now, if you filled out your FFL and you have an FFL, this has also always been part of the FFL and the renewal process. The stipulation has always been there that you have to have available for sale. Uh, it, it, they say available, but we know it's for sale. You don't have to provide these, but some type of a lock. And here this, here's the clarity. Uh, in this third bullet point, it says that, um, it is, has to be designed to be unlocked only by means of a key, a combination, or other similar means. 
And we don't, we haven't been able to ascertain why this is being issued at this point, other than maybe a campaign prop. You know, we're going into the 2022 midterm elections. Uh, the Biden campaign has not been able to pass any gun regulation, uh, gun control bills through uh, Congress. This is something for them to campaign on and talk about. And we are a little bit cautionary about why they're publishing this uh, as we run into the new year, because this can be a part of your, and it should be a part of your uh, IOI inspections as they occur going forward. So um, just be wary of this. It's not something new. It does take effect February 3rd. And again, we hope to see more information on this, but since it's part of the federal register, it might just slip through and all of a sudden be, be uh, entered and logged without being communicated. So we're a little bit worried about that. No, we try to get some answers. If you find anything um, uh, that, that makes sense, we'll communicate it to you by way of email. Um, but the pro proposed rule, again, is called the final rule. It's clarifying that a notice of revocation of a federal firearms licensee may be issued whenever the ATF director has reason to believe that a license fails to have been, uh, a licensee has failed to have secure gun storage or safety devices available at any place in which firearms are sold under the license. Again, uh, are we, are we uh, spending too much time on this, considering and talking about it? But we don't think so because we, we have seen, as we get into the revocation discussion a little bit later, we've seen the ATF issue notice of revocation for many, many obscure things right now. So just make sure you have your gun locks, firearm locks available on display in your shop. Uh, whenever the ATF walks in, actually whenever any, tra any transferee walks in. Okay. If you want to find out more about this document and the publication, there it is. It's over on the Federal Register under documents. All you have to do is search for secure gun storage. Okay. I have a question in that area. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it inferred like for ARs that you'd have to have something big enough to hold the whole item in versus just being able to lock the lock it. Yep, some, some folks have been sending us notes over the weekend because this did get published in one of our uh, trade, trade publications over the, uh, late last week. So this is not for securing your firearms within your FFL dealership or your gun range. This is for selling uh, firearms, transferring them, having your customer go home, and them having a security device for them to secure the gun at home. Uh, does that is that David who's asking that? Yes, it is. Yeah. And There's I just one. wanted to clarify, though, that you know you can have devices that would allow you to prevent that I, that gun from being used um, without it containing the whole rifle. Right. So, do we have to perpetually have in stock? Uh, devices that will contain the whole rifle that can be locked. Um, yeah, we, JC and I, believe me, we read through 23 pages of this yesterday to try to figure out what the heck they're truly trying to say. But the bottom line, David, is that a trick, for example, a trigger lock suffices. Yes. A okay. cable lock, a cable lock suffices through a cylinder or through a uh, okay. through magazine hold. Yeah, magazine well. So that that's as simple as it goes. But some folks, uh, I was at uh, I was at a deal the last month where they were using cable lock uh, 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 zip ties and providing those to their customers in lieu of a cable lock or something <laughs> maybe not provided by a manufacturer, say on it that you see in new gun uh, boxes today. So used guns, if you're a pawnbroker redeeming guns. Uh, you definitely have to have something better than a tie tie wrap or a zip tie available for your customer. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, haven't seen that, I haven't seen that in a long time. I'm surprised <laughs> to see it. So. And it very Thank specifically you. provides other device that is designed um, to be or can be used to store a firearm and is designed to be unlocked only by means of a key combination or other similar means. And the code actually calls out zip ties, rope, and string do not meet the definition. So. Right. Yeah, so some of you old school folks, make sure you upgrade a little bit. And again, you don't have to sell it to every customer. You have to make it available to every trap. Exactly. You don't have to give it. The only, the only provision is with handguns. The Youth Handgun Safety Act requires you to provide. This is not in reference to that. This is completely separate than that. Right. Good. All right. Great question. Thank you, David. 
All right, next, we're gonna talk about PMF. So what's a PMF? You may, I, I, we didn't hear about a PM, PMF until it's about two weeks ago. We realized that's a ghost gun. Uh, PMFs, according to the ATF, is new jargon being used, terminology for personally manufactured firearms. So you will be looking forward to this um, as you um, receive additional documentation or read articles online. Um, you know, ghost guns is just a very derogatory um, um, uh, term. They're trying to get away from personally manufactured firearms is the acronym being applied. And basically refers to um, uh, parts, kits, frames, 80% uh, um, lowers, and or unserialized uh, frames and lowers that are being used to build guns. The uh, ATF has been proposing some type of legislation uh, around the ghost, whole ghost gun concept for several months, about six months already under Biden. And uh, they are moving forward. And what they are doing now, we haven't seen one of these, but uh, there's letters being distributed to select firearm FFLs and guns, believe it or not, they're trying to find gunsmiths to answer several questions, kind of do a survey on how this uh, program can be rolled out to require if they if they move forward in Congress with a bill to do so, how they would require gun dealers, FFLs, type ones, type twos. Uh, and manufacturers, of course, but more so the type ones, type twos, to serialize firearms that are presented or brought into the shops, either as used guns or as pawned firearms, which you're allowed to do today. You're allowed to pawn and purchase firearms without a serial number. But in the future, if they said you can't do this anymore, how would you deal with that? Would you have the equipment on hand and in-house to do so? Would you have the skills? Would you have the knowledge? Would you have the disciplines or the... So the sending these surveys out to figure out what it would take to convert our industry uh, to do something different. And this, this is not gonna be an easy challenge for them. First of all, they're, they're more concerned with inventory already on hand in, in firearms dealers. Um, some of you I know sell 80% lowers. How would you take that inventory and modify it to be serialized? What, what challenges would you have, et cetera, et cetera. So, We'd love to hear from you. If you want to know select dealers, um, FFLs, who actually receive one of these letters, please uh, forward it on to us at info at ffl.consultants.com. Uh, and we'll uh, try to share as much information on this as possible with the rest of you. Uh, we do not estimate this to be a, a fast moving process. Um, there's no estimate on, on trying to introduce this as a bill or trying to get this implemented but it will obviously stay front and center uh, as, as are all of the Biden administration proposed gun control laws and bills. It will stay front and center uh, for the foreseeable future. They'll, they'll continue to make noise. All right. all right, how about some next info, JC? Yeah, so overall, I mean, yeah, we're, we're down 12% year over year from 2021 to 2020 as expected. But overall, um, second highest uh, overall transactions occurring uh, in all time since uh, numbers have been been being tracked. So uh, not a bad year overall, uh, considering when we start looking at the occurrences of 2018 and 2019, we're still way up. So 2021 may not have been the record year that 2021 or 2020 was, but still a lot of transactions occurring. Yep. JC, before we advance to the next one, I got a question regarding your uh, e form four. Yep. Who's supposed to do the rolling up the fingerprint for the fingerprint cards? Does law enforcement have to do them or can the individual do them? Whatever the jurisdiction allows. Um, so if you're qualified to take fingerprints, um, you just have to make sure that you know how to take fingerprints and what's required of those fingerprints. Um, with the live scan system, uh, this electronic system, the, the whole live scan system actually verifies that the fingerprints meet requirements. So that's that's the big deal. Uh, atypically, if you're not qualified or don't have, um, you know, a history of taking fingerprints and, and don't have that knowledge capability, uh, we always recommend going to an external entity. Cool. Okay. Otherwise, you take the risk that, you know, it gets kicked back and you have to start all over again. Right, right. All right, thank you for that question. Keep them coming. Inspection results of 2021. So we just did a, 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 an annual roll up um, for the last couple of months. So back in November, and again, we'll try to bring this information to you monthly. Uh, back in November, 
the uh, ATF did a 454 inspections with 11 warning conferences and six revocations. In December, uh, they, they, the number was only 378, traditional for the month of December, as obviously people are going on vacation, taking holiday off. Uh, and then the ATF has been very courteous to the firearms industry in the past as to not interrupt uh, operations during a, the couple of weeks leading up to Christmas. So this is traditional that we have a decrease in the month of December, but we still had eight warning conferences issued and uh, four revocation notice to revoke uh, letters issued. Now, the, make note that these numbers that I'm showing you for November and December are the result of inspections done earlier in the year, probably August, September. Uh, we just got word this morning that in October, inspection they've got their uh, report of violations first thing this morning so uh, atf came back to work last week and got some paperwork done so we expect to get a whole bunch of more um, updates this week and next and again we'll bring this information to you monthly and let you know what's going on as far as um, adverse actions and then the inspection process now, here's uh, information I will tr try to bring to you monthly as well going forward. Here's the inspection activities for the last month. This is where the ATF was in December and where they were not. So uh, interestingly enough, out of those 378 uh, inspections, most of them were done in Ohio, Kansas, the Ohio region, Kansas, Dallas, Texas, Phoenix, Houston, T Florida. Our typical um, acti active areas, these are active for one reason or another. And then at the bottom of the list, you have the highly regulated areas for the most part. Uh, New Jersey, New York, uh, California, DOJ in California, Seattle, um, San Francisco, New York, uh, New Orleans. Denver here it only had eight inspections. We're, we're a pretty big state as far as FFLs go. I'm not sure exactly why. I know we have had uh, significant COVID, Omicron um, illnesses. We've had a lot of folks um, obviously, you staying home, calling in sick and quarantining themselves. So that could be another reason for some of these lower numbers at the bottom of the scale. But it doesn't mean the ATF is not out there. They're out there um, uh, heavily in some of the other regions highlighted here. And then on the right in the yellow, you'll see where, which offices are, I want to say, cracking down harder than others. So uh, even though Columbus had the most inspections, no one received a rev revocation or a warning notice, which is great. Uh, good progress and good, good, good activities up there by the FFLs. Uh, Texas, Arizona, Kansas City, uh, Washington. This is Washington, D.C. area, um, New Orleans. So you do have activity out here. We have adverse actions. Um, if you haven't been inspected, congratulations. And remember, if and when the ATF does show up, please say hello to them, sit them down with a, uh, a bottle of water, give them their workspace, and then give us a ring. Uh, and make us a partner from the beginning of your inspection process, not from the end. That's that's where things go wrong. We can help you through the process so that we can help you alleviate some of the uh, adverse actions, if at all. All right. Uh, revocations and uh, what we're hearing in January, what we know. Again, uh, this is our friend, not so much our friend, um, Merrick Garland, spokesman for uh, the ATF right now because there is no director. He actually is in charge. And uh, Marvin Richardson, our uh, number two uh, friend over at the ATF, is actually reporting to this fellow. And uh, he's just delivering um, the zero tolerance policy. JC, you want to run through this? Yeah, so we went over this last month. We just kind of want to reiterate uh, what's what we're seeing currently as far as zero tolerance is concerned and uh, what they're defining as a rogue gun dealer. Go to the next slide. So a rogue gun dealer is uh, a single willful violation. And we'll get into what the willful violations are in a second, but uh, just let it be known to you all that uh, they are, we have already received many phone calls from various FFLs seeking support uh, as far as uh, revocation hearings are concerned and such uh, for, you know, one or two violations, real stuff that essentially before was no, no big deal. It was a big deal in the sense of you might get a warning letter or a warning conference. Uh, but now uh, that that option is out the door, ATF's hands are tied, and the expectation is is that if it's determined to be willful and it uh, falls into one of the five categories, then essentially you're going to get a notice of revocation. It, it is what it is. So um, <clears throat> we're looking to win some of these battles. Uh, we have a number of hearings coming up 
uh, that we've been called into. So uh, fingers crossed that we figured out some ways for people to keep their licenses. But the fact of the matter is, is uh, repeat problems. If you've had a previous inspection and received a report of violation or any type of adverse action, such as a warning letter or warning conference, any of those violations that were previously called out if they are repeat, that's considered a willful violation. So I would tell you that if you've had adverse actions such as a warning letter or warning conference and you have not been yet reinspected, expect that reinspection at the 12 to 13 month mark. So just, just be aware of that. Um, what we're seeing from IOIs, uh, <laughs> either they're completely passive, uh, they're just basically conflict avoidant, and they're talking to the FFL saying, you know, these things aren't a big deal. Just do this to get it fixed in the future, et cetera. And then we're seeing a revocation notice or the exact opposite. They're telling the FFL that the inspection's not going well and that they are going to re recommend revocation. So we're seeing both ends of the spectrum as far as this is concerned. Um, just know that, you know, if you're lucky enough, and we'll say lucky enough for a warning conference or a warning letter, just know the expectations are that you're going to stand up some SOPs, get you get your staff trained up, uh, and make it a reoccurring training. Um, what corrective research and and uh, corrective action you're taking to fix those? They're going to require that, especially for a warning conference. Not so much for a warning letter, but definitely for a warning conference, you're going to be called to the field office or to the uh, director to the field division headquarters. And you're going to actually have to sit down, explain yourself, explain what corrective action you're taking and what the future looks like for your FFL. So uh, it's pretty labor intensive. Uh, we've been involved in a lot of them. Uh, we have phone calls uh, pretty much on the regular now uh, with FFLs that have gotten themselves into trouble and they're looking for support. Uh, we've even had the ATF say uh, to some FFLs, you need to reach out to a consultant and talk to a consultant or a lawyer. So um, just be aware of that. It's, uh, it's pretty involved. So you want to avoid the headache. Next slide. Yeah, on, on this one, JC, you mentioned a warning conference. You know, we're, we're telling folks, you know, so we're getting calls from folks who got inspected in November, December saying, I don't think it went so well. And they haven't received their closing conference. They haven't received their closing uh, do, uh, documentation. They don't know where they stand, but they don't think it went well. They're saying, well, how can I get ahead of this? Because if you haven't been through this before, uh, once you get notice, you only have 14 days to uh, schedule your hearing, your meeting, your whatever it might be, your appeal. Uh, and it's a very timely uh, situation. Your notice gets delivered by registered mail. You get all scared and upset. You you start calling us. You call the NSSF if you're a member. Again, you can call us. It, you know, we are NSSF as well. Uh, and uh, start to explain this process and how to prepare for it. And these are the things we, we, we can't stop, drop and roll for everybody. And uh, JC and I were laughing because we usually take the week of Christmas off and we're working this week, just getting some of these SOPs ready and, uh, and some of the research done for some of our, our folks like you and uh, helping them all get, you know, understand how to do research for the report of violation issues what they have to, what, what they should document, what they should be ready to discuss, what type of SOPs they should be, re be ready to present, how much training they can get done, you know, prior to a meeting and document the training with your employees. All these little things that we put into what we call the package when we go and finally meet with the, in front of the ATF with our, our, our FFLs, how to promise that we're gonna fix everything that's happened in the past. Here's the documentation and uh, support to show that we're serious about this because that's what they want to do. They want to see you very serious about any adverse actions and, and, and how, do you, how are you going to prevent that from happening in the future? But it's not, it's not a fast process. So we, we say, if you got people in house who can do some of this, start doing it now. Um, very few FFLs we visit have an SOP manual, meaning a standard operating procedures or just an operating practices type of manual or any type of documentation showing that employees have been trained other than the on-the-job training that most of them get. So if there's any, uh, you know, we can spend a whole lot of time just talking about this, but to get ahead of this, if you, uh, definitely if you have a, an inspection and it does, it's not going so well, or like you have any of those issues JC talked about, definitely need to get ahead of this and start working on it before it's, before it's a time crunch. 
So here are some of the zero tolerance uh, items, the five. And, and number four and number five, I mean, that goes without saying. If, if, you don't, if you don't respond to a trace request or you refuse to allow ATF to conduct an inspection, that, that's kind of a no-brainer. The anticipation here is going to be that you're going to get revoked. They're going to challenge you on those things. But some of the other ones here, transferring a firearm to a prohibited person, that could be any number of different you know, ways that that could happen. And, you know, it could be you got it denied and transferred the firearm anyway. We've seen that happen multiple times. Uh, failing to run the background check. We've seen this one a number of times where, you know, well, for whatever reason, the background check didn't get run. There was some confusion between staff members. And then obviously falsifying records uh, such as the 4473. That's making changes to maybe what the uh, customer put in or uh, filling in a blank that a customer missed, things like that. So um, you want to be really cautious. Uh, transferring a firearm to a prohibited person could also be somebody that's self-identified as a prohibited person, or they, maybe they made a statement during the transaction. You never know who's around who could have overheard that. So um, just be really aware of, of these uh, issues and these concerns as far as zero tolerance is concerned. Yeah, JC, I had just on that first one here, I mean, we're dealing with an issue, a very serious issue, um, great, great gun range and uh, gun dealership, um, very, very um, reputable in his area. Anyway, one of his folks, he, he sells 7,000 guns a year. That's a lot of transfers. They have a big process, uh, all electronic, all digital, but here's what happened. One person, and this is all it took to get a, a notice to revoke. One person went ahead and was checking the NICS update report, the status report daily. You know, they did it every morning at their location, which you should anyway, at your location. And they, they had a delay that they thought went to a proceed. Okay, now granted they, they had, you know, you know, several, 10 or 20 of these a day moving from delay to the denial of proceed. One person made an error on one form and they accidentally transferred a firearm to a denied person. So what did they do? Um, they didn't call us, this was back in October, but now they're, uh, now again, it takes a few months for this to all culminate into a report and action by the ATF. But now the ATF says, well, and they, oh, they self-reported. They called the ATF, they fixed it. They actually got the gun back, but they called the IOI. IOI says, you know, can you get the gun back? Can you, you know, make sure that firearm goes to the right person, update your, your, your A&D book? No problem, all good. Because that occurred, even though it was corrected, because that occurred, they cited it on the violation as willful negligence. And unfortunately, this purse, this, this dealer again, because of one, we'll call it a major, zero tolerance issue, it, it's, it's turning into a, a very big problem for the uh, FFL. So detail, detail, detail should be the title of this slide. Just, um, just one, one incident, one bad willful negligence issue can get you in trouble. Okay. Yep. All right. Uh, here's all the, go ahead, JC. <clears throat> yeah, not accounting for firearms. Um, that's actually doing your inventory. You, if you've lost a firearm or, or you're not acquiring them properly, you're not disposing of them properly, um, that, that's a willful violation. And it's one that's catching people. So not verifying and documenting buyer eligibility. That's the, you know, checking their ID. Uh, if they're an out-of-state resident, making sure that you can sell them a firearm, um, making sure their ID isn't expired, things like that. So um, be aware of that. Not maintaining records needed for firearms tracing. That's the 4473. That's the 3310.4. That's you know all that paperwork that's required to be completed for firearms transactions. So uh, not reporting multiple sales of handguns. This is a big one. Rifles, if you're in a border state. Um, that's, that's a big one. 3310.4s. We have FFLs right yeah, now that have received adverse action, uh, such as warning conferences, for just missing two or three of those uh, 3310.4s or 3310.12s. So be aware of that for sure. Um, <clears throat> know that uh, those 3310.4s and 3310.12s are required to be submitted by the end of business day on the day that the transaction occurred. And you need to keep proof that you actually submitted them. We had an FFL, this was a few weeks ago, that I think they had somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 missing 3310.4s. 
And the uh, ATF told them, hey, listen, you had, you know, you're missing 30 to 40 of these things. We don't have record of it. The ATF is actually going to come in with a report to provide and actually check off to make sure 3310.4s are uh, recorded and maintained for every multiple sale. So in this particular case, for whatever reason, and yes, they do look at them, they didn't enter in 30 to 40 of them in the ATF database, but luckily that FFL had evidence of every one of those ones he submitted. So he was good to go. Uh, basically the ATF had to update their records and uh, that was a, a huge win on his part that he had evidence that he actually submitted them in a timely manner. So, and then obviously accepting expired ID that goes really in, hand in hand with the not ver verifying and documenting buyer eligibility. So what inspection changes have we seen? Uh, the biggest one are the warnings and the uh, whether it be a, a warning letter or a warning conference, uh, those FFLs are being revisited. Um, and it's at the 12 to 13 month mark. We've seen a few outliers go as far as 18 months, but the bottom line is if you've received a warning letter or a warning conference in the last 12 months, you're going to get reinspected. <clears throat> FFLs on demand program. Uh, excessive time to crime traces, those FFLs are being targeted because they're selling a lot of firearms that are ending up being used in criminal acts. So uh, there's a lot of focus there. Uh, if you haven't been visited in the last five years and are approaching potentially renewal, maybe not, um, we're seeing you guys getting revisited as well. Uh, any excessive denials, um, it, all of these things kind of push you above a threshold that you're going to get um, inspected. The excessive denials is the threat that you could potentially uh, be a victim of straw purchases. ATF LEO suspicions of straw purchasing goes hand in hand with the excessive denials. And then excessive theft losses. In the past, what we've seen is for theft losses, especially burglaries, the ATF would come out and be very supportive. They're out there doing your inventory, helping you fill out your theft loss reports, things like that, uh, helping in the investigation. Now, they're actually executing an inspection if you've been uh, burglarized. So be aware of that that was something that just came up probably within the last few months, I think, JB, yep. um, where we're starting to see the actual inspection occur, which was never the case previously. So yep. um, yeah, we had, um, I had one a couple of weeks ago, they reported two firearms missing. I'm sorry, they had a burglary, this burglary over in Pennsylvania. And they came in to do as they would respond to every burglary with a team of folks, did the inventory. But while they were doing the inventory, they identified extra guns in the store. So the inventory wasn't done in the prior year, 12, more than 12 months. So all of a sudden there's extra guns and the, the, the area supervisor leading the burglary response starts to scratch his head and says, wait a minute, we're looking for missing guns. We're not looking for extra guns. And hence sparked uh, a follow-up audit by the ATF within two weeks. So you gotta be careful of, of anything that's gonna raise their eyebrows. I want to go over this just real quickly. If you've ever been subject to any adverse action by the ATF, warning letter, warning conference, or obvious revocation, th this is critical that you understand this. It, it's the, this is on every closing paragraph of those documents that they issue to you. A lot of folks just forget about them or don't read them. And uh, we had someone a couple. We had a FFL last week call us in a panic. He's got a notice to revoke. He doesn't understand why. You know, JC digs into it, and we find out that he received. He said his last inspection was pretty good. Didn't remember much about it, it was several years ago, but we had him pull the uh, old email document from the ATF, which read, oh, it was a warning. It was a, a warning letter, actually. It wasn't just an okay visit he had several years ago, but he never really paid close attention to it. But the fine print at the end said, you are reminded that future violations, repeat or otherwise, could be viewed as willful and may result in a revocation of your license. So this, FFL, great guy, thought he was doing great, thought he was doing pretty good, had some of those minor issues. But since any, 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 any issue um, in the future, any violation can be deemed willful, which in this case it is. And again, was scaring to figure out how to win that battle. Um, and again, any, uh, unfortunately, per, per the recent policy, an FFL will face license revocation for any single willful violation. It doesn't have to be many. It doesn't have to be a 10-page violation report. It can be a one-page report with some severe 
concerning violations or even a single violation. Again, we can't re reiterate enough that everything has to focus on the details. So, all right, so what can you do? Hey, if you fall into any of these categories I mentioned, you know, take the steps to ensure whatever violations caused your issues before that the fixed, not recurring, go look at your old report of violations. They, you must not have a reoccurrence of a former warning violation. So just make sure you're 100%, at least 100% there. If you have new issues, that's a whole different story. But if you're re, you have reoccurring issues from the last inspection, whether it be two years ago or four years ago, that will be deemed willful violation, a willful negligence. Uh, if the problem was an incorrect acquisition of disposition records and unaccounted for firearms, begin monthly, weekly, quarterly uh, gun counts. Your immature, you know, we say gun counts. It's really easy to figure out if I'm supposed to have 101 guns or, or 810 guns in my inventory today. And then just physically run around and have your team count the guns. Make sure that you at least have the right number of firearms. Now, they may not be the correct firearms because of serial numbers and such. But a weekly gun count is the first step in making sure you have accurate record keeping on what's coming in and going out of your store. And then, you know, the serialized, the, 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 the best one is, <clears throat> pardon me, is to do a full gun, all gun steel inventory, serial number to book, book to gun, gun to book, just like the ATF does, and to do that regularly. All right. uh, so how do you prepare? Okay, uh, first of all, preparation is the key. And here's what you should be doing right now, right today. If there's a checklist, this is probably it for your FFL and for your team. We can't reiterate it, reiterate, reiterate enough how many times we say double check, double check, double check every 4473 before the firearm is given to the customer. Double check for delays, double check for NICS updates, double check for expiration dates, double check that every appropriate box is filled in. It only we we do this when we visit, we do four or five hundred of these, you know, sitting there for we do about 80 to 100 an hour is what our review process is. So it only takes about a minute to actually go over and review uh, the 4473. So that should be required mandatory practice right now if you want to save your FFL and not fall into the adverse action bucket. And why not have a third review before filing these? Uh, you know, have, why not have somebody great with detail look at these before they get put in a filing cabinet and put away uh, because they can be recalled and inspected again at any time. Uh, we're telling everybody that the inspectors usually go back one year. We're seeing them go, last week was 18 months. A couple of weeks ago was two years. Uh, we don't know. That's not the typical standard procedure for reviewing an FFL during an ATF audit. But we don't know what's being said behind the scenes, behind the curtains right now. We're not, we don't know if there's direction to go back until you find more violations. But they're allowed to. They could go back to the last inspection the last time you were inspecting, even, inspected, even if it was four years ago, by law, they can sit there if they deem necessary and, and, and spend the time and go all the way back to review all the form, forms from your, from your last inspection. So get it right the first time, do as many reviews now on your, on your transfer as being done today. Uh, acquisition and dispositions, do them daily. Don't wait till tomorrow, don't wait till the end of the week. If you can do them daily, do them daily. It eliminates confusion later. Implement your monthly gun counts we talked about. Take frequent steel firearm inventories. Again, never inventory off the box or a label or a hang tag. Make sure you take an inventory using the, the imprinted uh, information from the firearm. Uh, report your multiple firearm uh, long gun and handgun forms uh, daily. If you report them tomorrow, if you're a day late, it's late and it's a citable violation. Could cost you your license. Make sure we're doing that. Uh, keep proof you sent it, as JC said. The uh, 3310.12 obviously is only for border, southern border states uh, on the southern, you know, uh, bordering Mexico. So you guys do the long guns as well as the handguns. Uh, respond to traces same day. Otherwise, you get on the bad boy list. We don't, we don't want you to be responding late to traces. And obviously, implement your straw purchase training using the don't lie for the other guy materials available for the NSSF or other training that might be available. We have a video out on our YouTube site. If you need other, other, any additional help with that, please contact us and let us know. Right. <clears throat> so, so don't wait. Um, the big thing here is if, if you're lucky enough to find any errors 
uh, before you get inspected. Uh, the key to this is get them fixed. Um, remember that if you have transferred the firearm and the customer is out the door and the firearm is gone, you find an error on the 4473, it may require you to call that customer back. And that's all well and good. If you have a range, offer them some range time. If uh, you, know, you can offer them some accessories at a discount or offer them a free box of ammunition, whatever, get them back in the door. And when you make those corrections, make sure that you're making a photocopy of the page that the error was that uh, occurred on and make the corrections on that page, on that photocopied page, and make sure that they initial end date, initial end date the correction. Don't scratch out the error, single line through or strike through the error and have them make the necessary correction. It may still be a violation, but the fact of the matter is, is you're giving them something to show that you have a process for catching errors. And that's the key. This, this is what's going to help in the event that you have a scenario where you get revoked and we have to make the argument for you, at least we can say, hey, listen, wait a second. Yes, that was a violation, but they took corrective action measures long before the IOI ever found it. So uh, do not log in firearms such as special orders or expected transfers until the firearm is on premise. We just had an FFL manufacturer who had a uh, entire uh, pallet full of firearms getting ready to go out the door. And uh, we found out that uh, you know, he had already logged them out. So disposing of firearms before they leave licensed premise is a big no-no. You want to make sure that you don't dispose of your firearms until they're, they've left the building and are off premise out of your custody and control. Out-of-state resident sales. I don't know how many phone calls we get on the out-of-state resident sales. If you don't know, don't make the sale or at least be smart enough to pick up the phone and ask. Um, I'll tell you right now, there's a ton of different laws and requirements as it relates to various states, and you have to be very knowledgeable of what you can do and what you can't do. So be aware of that. Uh, and it only applies to long guns. We've had a lot of scenarios lately where uh, individuals out of state residents have gone to an FFL in a, in a joining state or while they're on vacation somewhere, and they've sold them a handgun. You cannot sell handguns to out-of-state residents, so be aware, it's long guns only. That does not include lowers. Lower is not a long gun. Lower is a lower, it's another firearm. So you can't sell those to out-of-state residents either. PGS, pistol grip firearms, you can't sell those to out-of-state residents. It has to be an actual long gun, a shoulder-fired firearm. That's a shotgun or a rifle. Ensure reporting of multiple handgun transfers, and multiple rifle transfers, if you're required, uh, in Southwest border states occur on the same business day. They have to be submitted by the end of the business day and keep proof that you submitted it. That's key. And then if you're, uh, you know, if you have other folks running your business and you're an absentee owner, you need to get actively involved because the ATF is challenging absentee owners, folks that aren't involved in the day-to-day -day operations. They're the responsible person. They're the key member of the organization, but they're just not paying attention to the business. The ATF is looking at you and challenging you on that attitude. So be aware of that. Hey, JC, on, on a quick one here on the out of state. For some reason, this came up three times in, in December, which is very unusual for the phone calls we get. But we have out of state folks with CCWs where they can bypass uh, a background check in their home state where it's permitted actually trying to buy long guns in other states where the CCW, well, first of all, CCW only applies, the exemption only applies in the state where it is issued. That's the first issue. But then, I mean, any out-of-state residents with a CCW, just secondly, they all get a NICS check. And we've had folks, you know, with the customers arguing with the FFL, and again, if you get an issue, you gotta, you know, you're not versed in all of this different statutory law regulations, Give us a ring. Uh, there's age requirements in different states. There's age requirements for long guns in, there, in certain states. There's AR restrictions. There's magazine restrictions. All these little restrictions. Now you can, again, we get these calls all the time. So they're only like, you know, 60 second questions for us. We pick up, we answer the phone, we give you an answer. We say, thanks, have a great day. But, or you can spend an hour on the phone looking it up, trying to look it up in the uh, state uh, legislature archives. Um, don't always believe everything you read on the internet That's or, or other gun dealer forums. We, we, we've had issues with that as well. Uh, go straight to the state statute if you want to find out what the firearm laws are for other states or just give us a ring. We usually have the answer or get it to you very quickly.
Um, one question, JC FOIA, is fax log proof of sending multiple sale receipts or traces sent okay? Sure, absolutely. Okay. But, but the issue with those fax logs is make sure you're either printing them out or re reserving them. I mean, this could, again, this is for the life of your, uh, from, from last inspection to new inspection. You don't want to lose those fax logs if they are from, you know, two years ago and you haven't been inspected in two years. Uh, most of the folks still using a fax are, are printing a confirmation page uh, because it shows the number, you know, but, but the fax log works, the electronic one, if you're using that. Or if you can print out a monthly log once a month, that that would serve well as uh, also. Okay. Oh, the old should I self-report? I think I told, I think I mentioned one story about self-reporting a missing gun or two missing guns. And there's another story about you know again um, selling the wrong gun to the wrong person, uh, calling the ITF and, and getting help on that. Yeah, they'll help you of course, but then those issues that you're self-reporting are all documented. You know, remember, they're a regulatory body. They're just not your friend on the other side of the phone. Just like calling the IRS. If you call, they're going to ask for your social security number and, and, and document the issue you're calling about. Same, same happens typically with the, with the ATF. They can log the issue you call about next to your FFL when they sit down monthly or quarterly to review all your FFL activity in the region. Your name's going to come up. Uh, so we do. So obviously, we want to support self-reporting. But we're saying it's risky. Uh, if you need a second opinion, just reach out to us. Maybe there's a way to fix your problem, make it correct without getting the ATF involved. There's always an option to do that. You can do that every day. Uh, if you need help with that, give us a ring. Okay. And hey, here's where we travel. We're almost ready for questions, so keep them coming. Uh, JC and I, we <laughs> we did this the other day for a different reason. We're like, wait a minute. You know, which states haven't we been to? Where do we not have uh, clients, either NSSF or FFL clients, FFL consultants? There's only a couple states. So if you're in North Dakota, give us a ring. We need to make a trip up there. Uh, but hey, here's where we're going over the next few months, uh, January, February, March, and April. If you uh, need a visit that you want to visit or, or an NSSF member, and you don't know if you, the last time you had a, a visit that you're entitled to, give us a ring. And we'll help you out. We'll figure it out for you and um, try to get that arranged. And here's where we are over the next couple of months live in person. JC will be at SHOT Show next week. Yep. Uh, very exciting. I'm not going. I'll be at an ATF uh, arbitration meeting here in Denver. Uh, but uh, sorry, I can miss it. Sorry, I made all uh, stop. Uh, I won't be able to shake hands and say hi to all you folks. But um, then JC will be at NBS in uh, February. And that's down in Texas. And then I'll be at the Texas Association of Pawn Brokers uh, representing the National Shooting <coughs> Foundation. So if any of you are going to any of these events, just, hey, give us a ring, uh, schedule some free consultation time with us, bring your questions, bring your problems, uh, bring the issues you don't feel comfortable talking about you know, in this forum. Uh, you wanna get ahead of things. or just wanna say hi and have a, have a drink. That's great too. Uh, we love sharing time with our our, uh, our FFL community. So with that, we're going to take questions. Uh, hey, Roberta, yes, see you at TAP. Make sure you let me know where you're going to be, and we'll find some uh, time together and um, go face-to-face. -to -face. Uh, that'll be great. Um, questions, JC, you ready? I'm ready. All right. This is some e-form questions sent in uh, earlier, uh, sent in yesterday, actually. Sure. Do, do, all, do you all help on the e-forms for Form 4? I guess we're referring to the new process. How does it work? And are there any videos I could watch? No real videos at this point. I guess we could probably work on that. But um, essentially, you have to sign up for e-forms, obviously, uh, which is real simple to do. Uh, it probably takes a couple of days just to get everything squared away. Uh, but uh, once you get uh, signed up for e-forms, uh, the next step will be making the decision as to whether or not, um, you know, you want to do the fingerprints in-house. And that means that you're going to have to get that live scan system, uh, as well as the, the uh, photograph, the passport photo system. So uh, it's a little bit of a capital outlay uh, to buy those systems. They're not cheap. Uh, but like I said, uh, you know, it helps with the process. It helps expedite the process. And the anticipation is, is that you're going to start seeing turns in two to three months on those form fours. Yep. So, you know, 
hell of an opportunity. I would tell you the e-form, I witnessed a couple of them last week while I was in Bangor, Maine, actually. Uh, a little time consuming. It tied up a staff member for about an hour. Uh, they, they processed two of them each day I was on site, and uh, I watched the process. Um, pretty simple process. Uh, you have your section as the uh, NFA dealer to fill out, and the customer has their pieces to fill out. Uh, and then they take the fingerprints and take a photo. So, uh, and everything gets submitted electronically. So yeah. not, not a bad process, a little time consuming, but overall not bad. Yeah, th this one, I'll say the same thing. E-Form says, I couldn't figure out, and then we'll get the Lance's question in a minute here, but the e -form says, I couldn't figure out how to get the customer under the dealer account. Looks like the customer has to ask the dealer to be one of these, a super user, a delegate, or a submitter. Say that again. Sorry. So it looks like it looks like the uh, when they when this person first went on with the e form they couldn't figure out how to um, designate who was who. It's asking um, who the customer is, which yeah. person is. The only user. time somebody is a submitter, submitter. Uh, you're the submitter as the FFL. Okay. Um, the only other time somebody a, a non licensee would be a submitter is on a form one, where they're registering a, a homemade firearm that's NFA. Yeah. I think this is simple. I tried e-forms and it cost me $400 just on one customer. I was thinking like a form three dealer does not have to pay and it should be uh, tax-free transfers. There's some hiccups. Is that yeah. Um, so what you're talking about, and this is something I don't know why over probably the last year, maybe two years now, uh, we've been seeing a lot of this. Uh, people who had previously purchased uh, NFA firearms, suppressors, SBRs, SBSs, now, all of a sudden, they want to trade them in for something new, or they, they just want to sell them to an FFL. Well, unfortunately, once a NFA firearm gets transferred onto a Form 4, it's done. It stays on the Form 4. So if an FFL wishes to purchase that firearm from that non-licensee, you'll have to do a Form 4. You'll have to pay the $200 uh, tax stamp on that and go through the process just like anybody else. And, and the trans, am I correct, JC? Not only the purchaser of the new firearm, but the seller of the new firearm, don't they have to pay as well? So you would you would pay on the transfer. So you would pay on the transfer back to the FFL, Hello? and then you would turn around and have to do. I didn't hear the doorbell. I'm sorry. When somebody else purchases it. Okay. So yeah. So if you, if you have any of you have questions on NFA or E forms. There's yeah. JC, JC's the expert on NFA. I'm not. So just there's JC's phone number right on screen, 720-431-8821. Give him a call if you have any NFA-related or e-form-related questions. Let's get to Lance's question here. Maybe I misunderstood. I have been required to have the locking device, i.e. a cable lock on my counter and available for customers to purchase here in my store. How is the new law changing that? And was that just for handguns? And now it includes rifles. So. So, so yes, Lance, this, this lock, now you have to have a locking device available for any type of firearm that you sell in your shop. Uh, somebody was mentioning earlier about ARs and, and, and uh, any, any, anyway, anything that you sell will be a, a shockwave, a bolt action rifle, a handgun, uh, shotguns, ARs, derringers. So seriously, anything you have, we're worried. We are a little bit worried that the ATF is going to sneak, do a sneak attack on this once it gets published in February and incorporate this detail into their inspection. We're gonna listen closely to, to all of you. We want you to tell us so we can share this information. But if you have an ATF agent, AIOI, or somebody just popping in to check on this specifically, please make sure you give us a ring, um, give us a little lowdown on what's going on so we can share with everyone in our community. Uh, but the answer would be yes, you have to have a applicable, the applicable locking device that would work on any firearm in your shop. So uh, to me, for the most part, trigger locks work. A cable lock may or may not work on every firearm. So as long as you have one of each displayed on your counter and always available for sale, you know, sell one, put one out, sell one, put one out, that type of thing, you should be all set. Mm -hmm. okay. Hopefully that answers your question. All right. Uh, does uh, JC, um, Here's some questions about file retention. Mm -hmm. How long do we have to retain the following files? He's got a list of them. You ready? Yep. Denials where no transfer was completed, but they had a next check. If you have an NTN number or your point of contact state has issued a control number, those are required to be maintained for five years. Okay. 
Keep nice. them in a separate file. Yep, separate file. Because they're income, they're not completed transfers. <clears throat> therefore, they I call it the five-year file. Right. Versus the the twenty-year or forever file. Okay. Right. <clears throat> Next, how about how long do we keep self-identified denials where there was no NICS? If you haven't if you haven't conducted a NICS background check, but you terminated the transaction because they self-identified as a prohibited person or whatever the case may be, um, you, you have no requirement by regulation to maintain those. I always say to do the same as uh, the situation with uh, the the ones that you do get a denied transaction or somebody self-identifies and you've run a background check or rather you haven't run a background check. Um, just keep them for the five years. That's our recommendation, but you do not by regulation have any requirement to hold those. Okay. How about canceled transfers where no NICS was submitted, where they just changed, changed the mind. I guess it's not a denial, just yep. canceled. No, no, nothing in regulation that says you have to maintain those. Okay. Canceled transfers with a mix, basically a delay never picked up or customer changed the mind after submittal. Yeah, again, if you've received a NICS transaction number or a point of, consent, a point of contact state control number after running a background check, you are required to keep those for five years. Okay. ATF <laughs> will come in and do an inspection and they will verify every one of those NTN and control numbers that you were issued. Yeah, that's the only report they walk in with, correct, JC? Yeah. Oh. Um, they, they'll walk in with that report. They know exactly from NICS, um, all your handgun transactions, all your long gun transactions, other transactions, and multiple sales. In multiple sale form, right. And and if you're an NFA dealer, they have a list of your NFA inventory. Yep. Right. Yep. All right. And then the last one from this uh, uh, FFL, copy, how about the copy of FFLs received from other FFLs with transfers? Yep. Uh, no requirement and regulation to maintain those. Uh, the recommendation is to keep a, a running file and to purge it on an annual basis. And any FFLs that you discover they have an expired FFL in your in your records, and you're still doing business with them, the recommendation is to obtain a new copy of that. Now, some people, some businesses, they put their FFL out on the website. Maybe it's as simple as that, or you reach out to them and say, "Hey, send me a new copy of your FFL." That's a recommendation, but not a requirement by regulation. I, yeah, while we're talking about this, I have an FFL who keeps a car every time he submits a NICS and gets a response, the NICS transaction report, uh, not the MDI report, but the, you know, the proceed or the delay or the denial report. He keeps a copy of it. He's, been, he's had issues before, so he's learned to keep a copy for every NICS check. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's so, absolutely. That, so that's highly, highly recommended practice. But the, his yeah. problem was, his problem was, again, he's a high, high volume dealer. So in that case, uh, and he keeps those separate. He doesn't keep those with the background check, uh, with the 4473s, because you know, he want, he, he's learned to you know, back himself up, but not give the, the ATF everything they need during the inspection process. He doesn't want to give them too much, too much paper. Right. He stopped attaching photos, photo, uh, copies of IDs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I told him, keep those NTN reports Mm -hmm. until he gets through another inspection then you get because he's got boxes full of them oh yeah the bankers yeah. boxes he has them by month just in case he's got to go find one yeah. someday during an inspection to prove that he sent that he did a background check properly or had the right um uh designation and um disposition on a background check so sure. yeah. yep so those yeah. i would purge after your inspections yeah. um while well, we're talking about a jc 3310.4s and 3310.12s File, we file them with the 4473 and we keep them forever, right? Exactly. Okay. All right. Keep them for as long as you're required to keep your the 4473, which yeah. is 20 years. All right. Next question is, uh, am I, what, what, can you explain briefly the process for an inspection? Never had one. Okay. Um, depending on where you're located, if you're an outlier, and you're pretty far from the field office, you may get lucky enough uh, to receive a phone call letting you know that an inspection will occur. Uh, sometimes they'll show up first thing in the morning. Uh, whatever your business hours are, that's when they'll show up. So if you're a 10 to 6 or 10 to 5 or whatever the case may be, that's what time they're going to show up. Um, they're going to come in. They're going to say, we're going to do an inspection. And uh, basically, they're going to find they're going to ask you for a place to work. Uh, they're going to ask you for the 4473s. 
uh, and they'll review every 4473 you've conducted for that period of time that they're conducting inspection for. Typically, it starts with an inventory, and that is a full inventory. Every gun in your shop will be touched. Um, and sometimes, depending on how many firearms you have in inventory, and that's what that initial like on-site you know, show up is for, is determine how many guns you have so they know whether or not they're going to need more people to help them with that inventory. Uh, once the inventory is done, uh, they'll typically send everybody home. Just depends on how many transactions you've conducted over the period of time that they're conducting an inspection. And then that IOI, Industry Operations Investigator, is going to sit there for a week or two and go through every 4473 and validate that the NTN numbers that have been issued to your FFL match up to every 4473 you have on file. And they're going to go through every 4473 and make sure everything is completed properly. Uh, you'll usually have what's called an opening conference, and that's that initial walk in the door. Uh, you may have a mid-conference, a mid-inspection conference, where they tell you kind of how things are going. And then you'll always have a closing conference, and they'll walk through any violations that they found. Okay. I think that's about it. That's the most concise version of an inspection I can give you. Uh, let's just try for one or two more questions here. Quick one. Yeah. Uh, questions about timing of receiving deliveries and make bound book entries if I'm away at a gun show. I guess this would be, um, you know, a sole proprietor, um, working <clears throat> a home based dealer, maybe yeah. asking the question. By, by regulation, you have until the next business day to get those into your book as far as acquisition is concerned. Now, there is an exception that allows for multiple days as long as the commercial records are viable uh, and meet basically the same specifications as what you put in the acquisition of a firearm. Uh, in other words, all of the information pertinent to the firearm, who you got the firearm from, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, atypically in my experience, and again, I was just at a, a manufacturer last week uh, reviewing uh, an invoice uh, from a company that they do manufacturing processes for. Sports. And the assumption was that that invoice, that work order, uh, covered the gambit yeah. of requirements uh, for, for utilizing a commercial record for those purposes. And after my review of it, we found that those commercial records were not viable. So you really have to pay attention to what that commercial record, that invoice, that manifest, whatever case may be, uh, contains to know whether or not it meets the requirements. So, but the rule of thumb is you want to get them in there as quickly as possible. So if at all possible, submitting them into the, into your record on the same day uh, is best, but you typically have until the next business day to get it done. Yeah. Yeah. Jesse, I, I don't know if you remember this conversation a couple weeks ago, but we had a, a ATF show up at a, at a deal, one of our clients, FFL that we talk to all the time. And he says, okay, they're here. I can't believe it. They're here. Okay, great. He, and they, yeah, he they already had done the closing, the opening conference rather high. We're here, who you know, exchange business cards, that type of thing, kind of explain the process. And he sat them down in their um, uh, break room to do their work for the couple of weeks they were going to be there. And long story short, he says to me on the phone on his first in the first 10 minutes, after the first 10 minutes of ATF showing up, he says, Should I tell them everything that's a problem? No. I said, what do you, I said, what do you mean? And he started rattling through, you know, we're waiting on answers from this. We need a customer to come back and sign that. We're checking this. Um, anyway, there's a miscellaneous little laundry list of problems. Anyway, that's the type of thing. I said, no, let's take a deep breath. Here's like JC just explained. Here's what they're going to do for the next couple of days. They're going to do your gun count. Let's talk about the pay. Let's talk about a strategy for fixing the paperwork if it needs to be fixed. Let's talk about a strategy that, and, and quite frankly, it was, we call it the overnight strategy. Somebody's, people are going to stay late tonight to fix things now that the, the crunch is on, mm -hmm. but let's fix them before, let's, let's, let's fix them before the ATF tells you they're wrong and locates them, the errors and in, in, incitable errors and violations. Yeah. So this is a, it's kind of a little fun little game we play if and when you get inspected, but make sure you call us. We want you guys to get past your next, next inspection with flying colors. We don't want you to have adverse actions. We want to see you in business for a long time. So that's what that call is all about is uh, last minute Charlie type of things. How do I fix this before this inspection goes through? And don't call us at the end and say, you know, we had 82 violations. Let's, 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 let's try to get ahead of a lot of those in the beginning. 
And we also have some very uh, creative strategies for you to uh, implement during the inspection process too. But we'll talk to you about those offline. I think the last one here is a good one, JC. Uh, question regarding marijuana use on a transfer. Customer came in about a year ago and he, he was self-denied because he checked marijuana use. But today he's no longer checking marijuana use. Can I sell? A, can I transfer a firearm? If you have a suspicion uh, on this particular case, um, rule of thumb is ask him. You know, right. you're you're the licensee. You're responsible for making a proper transaction. So you know it, it sucks. You, you don't want to have to deal with it. But unfortunately, federally, marijuana is still illegal. And you as a licensee have a responsibility and <clears throat> a requirement to make sure that that transaction is legitimate. And, so, and, and as we, as we <coughs> talked about many, many times in the past, ho hopefully you're qualifying every customer, qualifying the gun sale for every transaction absolutely. to prevent straw purchases, to you know, understand the need or desire for the firearm you're transferring. You're always gonna, as we say, you should always be able to raise your right hand and say, yes, I talk to every customer. I find out why they're purchasing. I authenticate the transfer. I, I, I basically qualify my transfer. I qualify my customer. Um, you know, every time we, we interact with somebody, especially people you don't know, new, new, new customers. And you know, as long as you're saying that, um, I agree with you, JC. I mean, that person can easily have stopped using marijuana a year ago for whatever reason, personal reasons, um, business reasons, employment reasons. Uh, drug testing reasons at, at new jobs. So today that person can be drug free. And again, uh, it's a discretionary call, but it's a good question. You yeah. have to make that call. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, well, I don't have any other questions in the hopper here, JC. Uh, let me just check the chat real quick and make sure. Uh, let's see, we have a suppressor that is not showing up. When we try to do a form three online, it is not showing in our inventory. We called in and they looked up the serial number, told us that it is in our inventory. So how do we transfer the suppressor out if we do not have it showing up in our online inventory choices in the online system? Well, first of all, they need to make sure, uh, you know, there, there's got to be something that is causing that. And I assume, Lance, that you're looking at your um, e-form system uh, as far as the NFRTR is concerned, um, call them and say, listen, this one's not showing up. So there's some sort of glitch. We've seen it happen before where uh, FFL has the Form 3. They have it in their possession. They're trying to sell it. Uh, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, systemically, it's not popping up. So you need to let them know, hey, listen, it's not showing up. So either we're looking it up wrong or you have it registered wrong. So give them a call back and let them know that. Uh, maybe I misunderstood. I've been required to have the locking device, i.e. cable lock on my counter and available for customers to purchase here in my store. How is the new law changing that? Yeah, Was we that just did just... that one, JC. Oh, we did that one? Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, think, yeah, I think that's it. Yep. I think we're good to go. Yep. All right, everybody. So listen, uh, yeah, hopefully you got, you know, hey, call JC directly, call me directly, whoever you're friendly with, comfortable with. Uh, we'll see you at SHOT Show if you're going. We'll see you at TAP if you're going there or NBS. Uh, in the meantime, we'll send a uh, recording link out to you guys uh, tomorrow or, or Wednesday, and we'll see you next month. And uh, thank you for everything. Have a great day. Thanks, y'all. So, Have a great week. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks, Brant. See you next month. All righty. Okay, bye.